I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, so that my voice, like my great show, will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great, and as I believe, happy majority. Welcome to Becoming Barnum, the journey to fame and fortune, a podcast presented by the Barnum Museum in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and based on their award-winning blog series. Support for this project is presented to the Barnum Museum from the City of Bridgeport American Rescue Plan Act Funds, Peoples United, a division of M&T Bank, and the Connecticut Humanities and National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. The Barnum Museum has a special treasure in its collection, a 750-page copybook of letters written by Phineas Taylor Barnum when he was traveling in Europe in the 1840s, introducing his young protege, General Tom Thumb, to high society and royalty, as well as millions of ordinary people. Barnum's lively letters to friends, family members, and business associates reveal him more completely as a person at times struggling mightily to make the three-year tour a success, all the while directing the management of his American museum from afar. They also offer insights into Barnum as a husband, father, and nephew, and as a mentor to the child actor-entertainer whose popularity resulted in their meteoric rise to fame and fortune. In his mid-30s at the time, Barnum proved himself a tireless go-getter calculating risk-taker, and astute entrepreneur decades before his name was attracting crowds to the greatest show on earth. These letters offer a window into the hard-scrabble era of show business, revealing how Barnum went about acquiring, hiring, and commissioning attractions, and promoting his museum and the general Tom Thumb tour in Europe. Join us as we travel back in time to learn through Barnum's own words about the real person behind the legendary P.T. Barnum. My mind is occupied with thoughts of home. As the end of the year holidays are approaching, it feels most fitting to highlight P.T. Barnum's letters home to his wife, sister, and daughter. These letters were composed in the mid-November 1845 time frame we have been exploring, when Barnum was in Paris. In almost every letter, whether to family or business associates, we see the refrain that he anticipated sailing home to America in the new year, along with General Tom Thumb's entourage. However, because the profitability of business was unpredictable, he cautioned that he might not return for some months to come. Barnum hoped the general's performances would be a hit in Paris, and more so in London over the holiday season. But after that, it would be a game of wait and see in regard to planning another tour of the British Isles. The downside to his potential financial success would mean staying overseas longer, which would prolong the feelings of homesickness. On November 12th, Barnum sat down to write a packet of letters home to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and to Washington, D.C. There were three, one to his wife, Charity, one to his sister, Cordelia, and the third to his 12-year-old daughter, Carolyn, who was away at school. To Charity, Barnum confessed that he had never traveled in so much misery as I do at present, owing to homesickness. I have got sick and tired of traveling and of remaining away from my family and my mind is occupied night and day with thoughts of home and with my business in America. This was not the first time Barnum expressed intense feelings of homesickness, but living in the age he did, there were no solutions to ease the longing via Zoom or Skype. He went on to tell Charity, Still, I grin and bear it, hoping that all is for the best, and feeling reluctant to give up on a good harvest for the sake of arriving a few months sooner in America. However, our faces are set for home, and we shall all feel uneasy till we get there. But the exact day, week, or month which we may sail is not only undecided on, but will in a great measure depend on our success in England. So you too must grin and bear it. Consistent in his inability to resist a little barb to his wife, he added, 
certainly you have the easiest part of it, and it is for your good, as well as for the children, that I am continuing a little longer to strive for the root of all evil but every man's desire, money. Had he known that his wife was pregnant, he might have been gentler with his words. Sharing more pleasant news, he told her that while in Paris he had made some purchases for a house they hoped to buy or build in the next year or so. He noted, I made an extensive addition to our stock of furniture yesterday in the purchase of an ivory salad fork and spoon. I have also bought a few colored pictures, prints, for the house representing Palais Royal, Tuileries, Hotel des Invalides, Place de Concorde, Versailles, etc., etc. These he would add to a crate containing some of the porcelain dinner service they had purchased at an estate auction in the spring. For some reason, box number two had been overlooked when arranging for shipping home in the summer, and as it wasn't full, Barnum decided he might as well add a few more luxuries for their future home. This was the extent of his news to Charity. He had already written a letter to his sister, which she would share, and he therefore saw no need for redundancy. Cordelia was one of Barnum's younger sisters, and she had just lost her husband, John Benedict, to tuberculosis in June of 1845. Left destitute after nursing him during his long illness while also caring for their infant son, she did not have the money for a proper funeral nor even clothing for it. An uncle informed Barnum of her poverty, and he sent Cordelia money. He also suggested she live with Charity and their daughters to save up a little money she would earn as a tailoress, and Barnum's letters bear out that she did in fact take his advice. Cordelia seems to have been a more reliable correspondent than Charity, though she mentioned to Barnum that it was a task for her to write due to her poor spelling ability. His reply contained something of a lecture to her on the importance of good spelling, and he seemed a bit taken aback that she had not learned to spell in school. Since she was a full decade younger than he, it is not surprising he knew little about her schooling, and his remark implies a comparison to his own lack of opportunity. Of course, I care nothing about bad spelling in any letter which I receive, but still you ought to spell well. Indeed, I thought you had had tolerable good opportunities for education, and I never knew before that you had not well improved them. He went on to refer to bad spelling as a shameful fault, and one so easily remedied it is worth removing. His solution was for Cordelia to devote one hour per day, every day, to learning to spell, as he was sure she could learn in six months. Given that she was trying to earn a living and care for her young son, devoting an hour a day to this improvement would not have been so easy for her. Explaining the reason for his older brother tone, Barnum wrote, Understand me, I am not grumbling about receiving letters with bad spelling, for I had much rather receive them than none but I am writing for your good. A person without education cannot command that respect in the world that one with education, all other qualities being equal, can. And there is nothing which more readily exposes a person's bad education than bad spelling. Your spelling is not very bad, and therefore is easily remedied. As you may recall from an earlier podcast, A Mountain of Worries, that Barnum had criticized daughter Carolyn's spelling when he replied to her letter asking permission to attend a masquerade ball. Barnum refused her in no uncertain terms, and then proceeded to admonish her for misspelling a couple of words. Now we find another example of his correspondence to Carolyn, and though less harsh than the September 13th letter, the tone is not as affectionate as one might expect. In fact, Barnum's letters to Carolyn contrast with his doting expressions of concern for her little sister Helen. In every letter to Charity, he begs to be informed of Helen's health, which at times seemed precarious. To Cordelia, Barnum wrote, I am in hopes that Mrs. B's health is better, and I am rejoiced to hear that old Podgy is well and fat again. Don't, for mercy's sake, let her be exposed to the cold, for you all know how liable she is to take cold and how cruelly she suffers when she does so. I really feel I could not survive her loss. I hope if those lumps are still on her neck, some good physician is attending to them. If her mother has neglected that, do so. Set Dr. Middlebrook at it at once. Don't delay another single day. A moment of humor, for us, arises when he writes Cordelia that 
Ellen must have a new spelling book and not read in one that has such naughty words in it. I hope she learns her book. Was that old spelling book one that had belonged to Carolyn? Barnum's young protege Charles Stratton, also known as General Tom Thumb, was only two years older than Helen, and he watched over Charlie's education with concern as well. With glee, he told Cordelia, The general has begun to learn like a little witch, and he likes his book he never did before. So if Helen don't look out, he will beat her. Charles was seven and a half at the time. Since Barnum's own formal education had been so minimal, he wanted nothing so much as that his children should receive the finest education possible. Carolyn, being at an age when girls of well-to-do families were often sent to boarding schools, what some call finishing schools, earlier in the fall, Barnum had accepted his uncle Allenson Taylor's assistance in choosing a school for Carolyn, where she would learn French through immersive experiences. He was adamant that she learned to speak, read, and write the language fluently. We eventually discovered Carolyn had been sent to a school in Washington, because Barnum later mentioned to Charity that they would visit their daughter there as soon as he returned. We wondered if there was a way to find out the name of the school Carolyn attended, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Barnum begins his letter to Carolyn, telling her, I am glad to hear from your mother that you are attending a good school at Washington, and that you like it and feel contented. It is much better for you to attend a school some distance from home, as it learns you to do things for yourself. At least, I hope it has that effect, for it is very necessary. I hope to be home this winter, and shall go almost immediately to Washington to see you, and I hope to find not only that you have improved your French, but also in your other studies. Now is the very time of life for you to learn. You can now learn double in the same length of time that you can when a few years older. And as you do not want to be cooped up in school all your life, the faster you learn, the better. For you must have a perfect and thorough education before you leave school. Much like Barnum's challenge to Helen, conveyed through Cordelia, to make good progress and not let Charles beat her in reading and spelling, he remarked to Carolyn that, the general has picked up a good deal of French, and he sings a French song. Barnum also expected her to hop on the train in Washington and visit Uncle Allenson, who had recently become a co-owner of the Baltimore Museum. He asked her to write to him and find out if he will meet you at the railroad on her first visit, but advised her with subsequent trips to engage a cab to take you to the museum, and there you will either find him or his address. He thought she could manage to do this on occasional Sundays every six or eight weeks, and while visiting, she should consult him and take his advice about what studies to pursue. We were quite surprised at the expectation that a 12-year-old girl would travel on her own on the train, the only concern being that she not go out when it was very cold for fear of getting sick. Perhaps this is why Carolyn had considerably more pluck than her mother when it came to traveling to new places. As a teen, she accompanied her father on some of their North American tours, and even kept a journal. Now to the quest to identify the school. Knowing only that Carolyn was at a boarding school in Washington, D.C. in 1845, and that the school had a strong focus on French, Adrian St. Pierre, our curator, turned to newspapers of that location and time period, especially late summer issues when ads for schools most often appeared. It was common for schools for young ladies to include French among the subjects taught, but Adrian hoped to find a school in which French was integral to the curriculum, as Barnum had desired for Carolyn. A lengthy ad in the August 14, 1845 issue and other issues of the Alexandria Gazette announced that Mrs. Mary L. Eliason would open a boarding and day school at her residence, for the instruction of a limited number of young ladies in the several branches of a thorough English and French education. Noting also that the French teacher will reside in the family and the pupils will be taught to speak accurately as well as to read and write the French language, this one seemed promising. The ad was aimed at members of Congress who have daughters to educate. However, further research revealed that Mrs. Eliason was a member of the long-standing Robert King Carter family and descendants who were considered the aristocracy of Virginia with their extensive plantations. 
Mary Eliasson herself is included as an owner of enslaved people in the 1850 federal census slave schedule. We wondered if that situation would have been acceptable to Barnum, and if Carolyn would have felt out of place with the daughters of Washington's elite. Scouting for school ads in another Washington paper, the Daily Union, turned up one that seemed aligned with Barnum's views, and is actually quite different from most school ads. Keep in mind that it was Barnum's uncle, not he, who was tasked with researching schools, though Barnum advised him on what he was seeking. The ad was placed by a Mrs. David H. Burr, Sophia H. Howell Burr, and ran from May 1845 to late fall of that year. As far as we can tell, that was the only year she advertised. The ad announced that Mrs. David H. Burr's French and English Seminary for Young Ladies, corner of E and 9th Streets, Washington City, was a house large and commodious with ample grounds and other facilities for amusement and recreation. Mrs. Burr herself was a native of France and conversant with the best and easiest modes of imparting to her pupils a perfect knowledge of that language. Further, the ad notes that pupils who reside in the family have the particular advantages of hearing and conversing at all times in the French language, which was certainly Barnum's goal for Carolyn. Following a description of the course of instruction, the ad states that the discipline is mild and affectionate, yet decided, and is maintained by appeals to the affections and conscience of the pupil. It is designed, by a proper development and cultivation of the better qualities of the heart, to bind more affectionately the pupil to her teacher, and by it to secure obedience. In addition, a student could attend whichever church her parents selected, or attend the Episcopal church with the principal. Barnum would likely have wished Carolyn to attend a Universalist church if possible, Although we can't be certain Carolyn went to Mrs. Burr's seminary, the tone and perspectives Mrs. Burr conveys in her advertisement seem to be a good match for the perfect and thorough education Barnum sought for his eldest daughter, and she would likely be at school for three or four years. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this episode of Becoming Barnum, The Journey to Fame and Fortune. This podcast was produced by the Barnum Museum. All episodes are based on the blog series Barnum's Letters from Abroad by Adrian St. Pierre, curator of the Barnum Museum. Editing and sound design are by Rui Pino, and narration by William Saris. Kathleen Marr is our executive director, and John Swing is our chief operations officer. Please visit our website at www.barnum-museum.org to learn more about the museum. Don't forget to connect with us on social media and visit the Barnum Museum's YouTube channel for behind-the-scenes presentations of our fascinating collections and more stories about the legendary showman. Please tune in next time as we continue our adventures in Europe with P.T. Barnum.